you would turn your Bibles with me to the book of Mark, Mark chapter 1, as we continue our series through uh, this, this gospel, this book. It's been a joy, a privilege for me to uh, look at these passages and to preach from them. Uh, we're, we're bringing this, this first chapter to a close here as we draw near to the end of it. Uh, we're going to begin at verse 36, pick up where we left off, and we're going to go down to verse 39, Mark chapter 1, verses 36 through 39. Hear the word of the Lord. Mark is writing here, and he writes, Simon and his companions searched for him, that is, Jesus. Verse 37, they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. He said to them, Let us go somewhere else, to the towns nearby, so that I may preach there also, for that is what I came for. And he went to their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father, I am so weak. I pray that you give me grace to preach your word accurately and clearly. I pray for your people to be edified, for lost souls to be saved, and for Christ to be praised as He is exalted, as He is put forth, as He is offered, Father, as the outward call of the gospel goes forth. Father, I do know that your Spirit will work where the Word goes forth, that the Spirit's ministry is inexorably linked to the Word, and so I take great confidence knowing that reality. I pray that Christ would therefore be honored as His Word is preached. And in all things. I pray these things in His name. Amen and amen. The title of this sermon is The Importance of Preaching. The Importance of Preaching. A few months ago, I had found myself in a prayer meeting at a ch church in this area with a few friends of mine, and we were praying for revival. But before we began the prayer meeting, a couple of the members began to gripe about the last week's service at this particular church, and it just happened to be a Southern Baptist church in this area. And it was a couple of men, and they had complained that in the service the previous week, there had been no preaching. That the pastor had not ascended into the pulpit to thunder forth the scriptures, but instead he held himself aloof and stayed seated. And in place of the preaching in the service, they had something to the effect of a musical performance. I'm not exactly sure in full detail what it was, for I myself did not go and was not there, but that is what I gathered from their complaint, was that instead of preaching, there had been some sort of performance put on during the service. And that somehow was a sufficient substitute for the preached word, at least in the minds of the people who had organized this particular service. And it was interesting, because in that prayer meeting, a couple of the women had objected to the complaint that these men made saying that they enjoyed the performance and they were very blessed by it. And perhaps there had been truth conveyed as the performance came about. But nonetheless, the complaint that those men made and that complaint that I heard those months ago was true. And it was right. It was right for those men to be upset. And they ought to have taken such an issue to the church's leadership. And rebuke their pastor for having not preached the word. See, brethren, when we conceive of the life of the church, the church of the Lord Jesus Christ, its daily health, its edification, its continuance, its being built up. As we conceive of Christ's kingdom, how is it furthered? There are means that God uses to build his kingdom. 
And one of those means that is of great importance is preaching. Is the preaching of the Word of God. The preaching of the Gospel of Christ. In terms of the life of the church, it's at the center. If you like this in your church, I would submit to you that you do not have a biblical local church. But instead, a meeting of people that is more about socializing than it is about worshiping God. That's how serious the preaching of the Word of God is. And we must take it that serious. For our Lord Jesus Himself took it that serious. And that's what I want us to consider this morning as we look at this passage and others from the Scriptures of the importance of preaching. One, how Jesus made it a ministry focus. It was one of the focuses of His ministry on earth. Oftentimes we think of Jesus coming to die for us, and that certainly was His main purpose. But there were other things He did. He healed, He cast out demons, and one of them was that He preached. And He made it a great focus to do so. Also, I want us to consider the need for preaching. The act of preaching as well. And lastly, the effect of preaching. The effect that preaching procures. Now, before we do that, of course, I would like to consider the context and just briefly review what we've looked at thus far. If you will uh, look with me at verse 35, we remember this. Last time that we looked at this chapter, it says, In the early morning, while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, that is, Simon, mother-in-law's house, or I'm excuse me, not Simon, mother-in-law's, but Simon's house, it says, and went away to a secluded place and was praying there. And I preached the entire sermon on that verse of prayer, how it is exemplified to us by Christ. And even before verse 35, as I just mentioned, Jesus had entered into Simon's house, Andrew's house, and healed Simon's mother-in-law. We know that also that created quite a stir in the local area, and he had crowds waiting at the door. And he healed many with various diseases and casted out many demons. So Jesus here was doing miracles, but he took time to pray and he gave himself a prayer. And that's where we find ourselves at the beginning of verse 36, because that picks up right where we left off in verse 35, when Simon and his companions are searching for Christ. They're searching for Christ. So there are four points I would like to make this morning. Firstly, Jesus' ministry focus, which is on verses 36 to 39. Then, number two, the need for preaching. Three, the act of preaching, that is, what is preaching in its essence. And then fourthly, the effect of preaching. So let us first consider Jesus' ministry focus. Jesus' ministry focus, that being preaching. And that's in verses 36 to 39. And firstly, the Lord makes a statement. Look with me, verse 36. It says, Simon and his companions search for him. So they were trying to find the Lord. Probably confused as to where he went. But the Lord's actions spoke many words to them. For they saw that he is a man of prayer. But it says, verse 37, they found him and said to him, Everyone is looking for you. These words carry with them somewhat of an aspect of urgency. There was an excitement the night before. The disciples had that fresh upon their minds. Jesus was this miraculous man, the miracle worker. The God-man who could, who could heal and cast out demons by his own power. There was excitement. Verse 38. Listen to Jesus' statement. It says, He said to them, Let us go somewhere else to the towns nearby, so that I may preach there also. For that is what I came for. 
He desired to move to other towns, to other areas. To give himself to an itinerant ministry. To move and to proclaim and to spread the gospel far and wide to the people of Israel. For he says, so that I may preach there also. For that is what I came for. That was his purpose. And he states it clearly. He states it clearly. Now look at the Lord's flight to action. Verse 39. And he went into their synagogues throughout all Galilee, preaching and casting out the demons. Now the Greek word here for preaching is caruso. Caruso. And it means to herald, to proclaim, to preach. But it especially carries with it the idea of authority, weight, and force. There's, there's something behind the words of the preacher. We know that that's authority from God Himself. Preaching is not a lecture. Preaching is not even teaching merely. It is doctrine ablaze. It has power and authority and weightiness upon the uh, consciences of men. And we see that in the Greek there. Not only did our Lord make the statement that it was His ministry focus, but He went to action with it and proclaimed in the local synagogues throughout all Galilee. Now secondly, let us consider the need for preaching. The need for preaching. Brethren, man is in need of something. He is in desperate need of something. And that is special revelation from God. Special revelation from God. He does not understand spiritual things. He does not know of them. He has an ignorance of God. He has been cast out of the presence of God. We know that that happened in Genesis. Right after man's fall in the garden, God banned them from the garden. And therefore, all of Adam's posterity have been set apart from God. Separated. And have an ignorance. They do not know Him as they ought to. They do not know Him as they must to be saved. As I quoted this morning in our Sunday school lesson, and the Baptist Catechism, question three, is how do we know that there is a God? Or how do we know that there is a God? And the answer is, the light of nature in man and the works of God plainly declare that there is a God. But His word and spirit only to effectually reveal Him unto us for our salvation. See, we must be knowledgeable of God. We must know God. We must know who He is. His Son. If we know not anything of Christ, there is an impossibility of salvation. For Christ is the only way. And so we must be revealed. that We must have revelation given to us. Specific revelation from God. Paul speaks of man's inherent knowledge of even holy spiritual things, though. It's not that man knows nothing about spiritual things. For what do we find around the world? Every man has in him the seed of religion. The built-in propensity to worship. We look around various cultures. They cannot help but worship. They are false gods, but they cannot help but worship. And even in the secular societies, they will often pride themselves, we do not worship gods. We are secularists, naturalists. We are evolutionists and atheists. We do not worship anything. Brethren, they are fools for saying such. They do worship things. Their gods take different forms than those of the pagans. The outright uh, uh, worshippers of other gods. Their gods take the form of money. Knowledge, intellect, sexual pleasure. These are the gods of the atheist and the naturalist. Every man is built to worship, but because of sin and because of his lack of knowledge of God, he worships false gods. And he knows not the true God. 
And so God must condescend to give him inherent knowledge. To give him knowledge of himself. As I said, Paul speaks about this in Romans 2. Speaks about man's inherent knowledge of some spiritual things. But notice, he does not speak of their knowledge of Christ. Or their knowledge of how God saves sinners. And that's important. That's absolutely necessary for salvation. Romans 2.14, Paul says, For when the Gentiles, who do not have the law, do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves. In that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness in their thoughts, alternately accusing or else defending them. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. So what is Paul saying here? Man even knows some things concerning the law of God. For they are built in. It's not as if he is altogether ignorant. He is ignorant of something specific, and that is salvation in Christ. Therefore, it is called special revelation. Specific revelation. There is an insufficiency of general revelation. There is. It's insufficient for salvation. Men are without excuse, that is true. For they know that there is a God. And they know they must seek after Him to know more of Him. However, it is not enough for salvation. For even Psalm 19.1 says, The heavens are telling of the glory of God. And their expanse is declaring the work of His hands. So even creation, not only the conscience of man speaks through his knowledge of God, but even creation itself shows us the glory of God. But is that truth enough for salvation? Certainly not. Man needs more. He needs special revelation. And therefore, preaching is important. Because preaching makes known to men specific revelation from God. And that's why I want us to consider, thirdly, the act of preaching. The act of preaching. Preaching is essence. What is the essence of preaching? Oftentimes I speak on it and the importance of it, but what is it? There are seven things that I thought of in terms of the essence of preaching. Seven things that I would like to list off and to cover and to consider. This is not an exhaustive list. This does not cover everything. <laughs> Honestly, my dear brethren, there are probably endless reasons as to why, or as to the or, uh, endless aspects to biblical preaching. There's so many aspects to it. But these are seven I want us to consider. Firstly, and first and foremost, the most important, it is biblical. It's biblical. That is preaching. In fact, if the Word is not being preached, if the Bible is not being preached, if the Scriptures, if the arrow of the Word of God is not being shot when preaching is happening, then let us not dare call it preaching. Hebrews 4.12 For the Word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, both of joints and marrow and is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. We know preaching is powerful. It only comes by preaching the Word of God. In fact, we see here in Hebrews 4 that the Word of God changes the heart, the inward man. Therefore, when the Word of God is preached, the inward man is changed. And effect is brought about. Oftentimes, preachers will speak on, well, the culture. We need to learn about the culture. The culture. The culture. Sometimes I call it the dreaded C word. We need to take polls. We need to learn what's the latest trend. We need to, so we can, we can, 
talk to the culture. We can, we can make things known to the culture. No, we need to go to the Word of God and know what God has to say concerning man and concerning how we are to proclaim the gospel, and we need to do it. We don't need to try and figure out where the world is. We need to go to God and say, God, where are you? What is your truth? We're going to be with that. We're going to stand upon your word. And your word is going to go forth. Any man who claims to be a preacher but does not say, thus says the Lord, and right after tells you scripture, he's not a preacher. He's not a preacher. If, a man, if someone who is claiming to be a man of God stands on a pulpit and says something, he ought to give chapter and verse. He ought to build his theology and build whatever he is saying in that sermon upon the Scriptures. That's biblical preaching. In fact, preaching itself is built on the Word of God. If anything you say is outside of Scripture, it's no longer preaching. A renowned man of God once said, the preacher has nothing to say apart from the Word of God. That's why I myself am very dedicated to a specific form of preaching, and it is called expository preaching. Exposit means to explain, to exhibit. What am I explaining? What am I exhibiting? The Scriptures. Expository preaching is going to the Scriptures and building your sermon upon whatever the scriptures say. Not the other way around. Which is what many so-called preachers do. How can I think of something I want to talk about and then find scriptures to justify it? No, we go to scriptures and say, the word of God dictates what I say. The word of God commands my preaching. And not only that, even there is a very good thing to preach verse by verse. For the Bible was written to us in a chronological order. It was written for us in a chronological order. Men inspired by the Spirit of God wrote beginning to end. Not all over the place. You can certainly preach expositionally and jump all over the Bible. But... God gave us His special revelation in the form of books, and it is fitting to begin verse 1 of a book and go all the way to the end. Because one, we got exactly what the author was trying to convey. The full, the full context and God's full revelation has been declared. Every preacher has this bent, and I do too. I have this bent, I have this weakness as a man to preach on my favorite topics. Preach on things I want to. Every preacher does. There are topics that they love and delight in. And sometimes they can become unbalanced. Preacher on the same five or ten things, right? However, when they go verse by verse, the scriptures command the topic. The scriptures set the agenda. In fact, as we go through this book in the mornings, if you want to know what I'm preaching on the next week, look at the next verse. If you want to know what I'm going to be preaching on the week after that, look at the next few verses. And this helps the preacher because whatever he's speaking on is dictated to him by the Word. Therefore, the full counsel of God is proclaimed. See, a preacher has a very great responsibility. He's proclaimed the full counsel of God. Not just the things he wants to say, not the things that he thinks his people can handle, but everything. Everything. Now, I want to give an example from Scripture on biblical preaching. And I would invite you to turn there with me in Nehemiah chapter 8. Nehemiah 8, very interesting chapter. Nehemiah 8. This is on Ezra's reading the law. Reading the law of God. I'll begin verse 1. It says, And all the people gathered as one man at the square which was in front of the water gate, and they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses which the Lord had given to Israel. A 
It's important to note something. At this point in Israel's history, they returned from captivity back to Israel. And they had not been following the law of God. God had punished them, and now they're back in Israel. And they all gather together in Jerusalem, and Ezra is going to read from the law of Moses. It's going to be the first five books of the Scriptures. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Verse 2 says, Ezra, Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it before the square, which was in front of the water gate, from early morning until midday, in the presence of men and women, those who could understand. And all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Verse 5, Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people, and when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people answered, Amen and Amen, while lifting up their hands. Then they bowed low and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Verse 9, Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people and said to all the people this day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. This is powerful. Why was it powerful? Why was the specific event of this man reading from the scriptures powerful? Because he read from the scriptures. You see that? Preaching, true preaching, is from the Word of God. Don't come around with your thus says the Lord if you don't have a scripture reference to back it up. No one cares what you think God told you in your dream last night. We care what the Word of God has said. We care what the Spirit has inspired these 40 plus authors to write over the 1600 year period. That's what we care to hear. And the true Christians are rejoicing that. Psalm 1 2. The righteous man delights in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. Therefore, he delights to hear biblical preaching. Secondly, I want us to consider that preaching is theocentric. Theocentric. And that's a very carefully chosen word. Sometimes we will say preaching is Christ-centered, and that is true. However, it's more than that. It is theocentric. Now, theo is derived from Greek. It means God. God. That's where we get that English word theo, the uh, prefix theo from. Theos in the Greek. God. It is God-centered. Biblical preaching focuses on God. Who God is, what God has said, what God has done, what God has decreed. How has God accomplished redemption for His people? True preaching not, does not focus necessarily on man and man's aspirations and desires. It focuses on God and God's glory. On the furtherance of God's kingdom. Biblical preaching sets out to bring glory to God and to excite the listeners to worship God, to focus on God. In our culture and society today, brethren, there is much that is said about self realization, self fulfillment. Or as even some so-called preachers and teachers have said, self-love. Brethren, this is not biblical. We are not to conceive of this reality in this way. That's not reality. That's not 
What the Bible even speaks of. It speaks on God, who God is. And therefore, when the, the, the word is preached, it therefore is theocentric. And it's interesting. I purposely listed these, re, the, these aspects out, these seven aspects of preaching, in, in order, in a logical order, because you first begin with Scripture, and then where does that lead you? Instantly, it leads you to be theocentric. And the reason I did not, as I said earlier, did not choose the term Christ-centered is because it's not just about Christ, but about all three members of the Trinity. The Father, the Son, and the Spirit. The one true God working all things for His glory. So, therefore, if preaching is biblical, it will be theocentric. Thirdly, Another aspect of preaching is it deals with man's sin and man's deadness in sin. It deals with man's sin and man's deadness in sin. True preaching, because it is biblical and because it is theocentric, it deals with man. It deals with mankind as he is. It doesn't sugarcoat it. It doesn't try and say, well, man is, he's got some problems. Or, well, man is ill and sick. Preaching it says man is dead in sin and wholly a hater of God. And he wills only to sin. He loves his sin. And the only way he can be saved is by the radical power of God in his life to save him. That same power that rose Christ up from the dead must work in him or he will not come. He will not embrace Christ. He will not repent and believe in the gospel And it tells men this. It confronts the sinner with his state. So that he might be saved. Fourthly, preaching proclaims the gospel of Christ. It proclaims the gospel of Christ. Because preaching is biblical... Because it is theocentric and because it deals with sin and man's deadness in it, it thereby must proclaim the gospel. And it does. True preaching is gospel-centered. It always goes back to the gospel. The, the roads always lead back to the cross of Calvary. And sadly... Though this area of the state of South Carolina is very inoculated with forms of Christianity, or so-called Christianity, we might say, there is very little gospel preaching. There is very little. Hardly any. Because what is the gospel? It is not God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. Or ask Jesus into your heart. 1 Corinthians 15, verses 3 through 4. That Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures and that He was buried and that He was raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the essence of the biblical gospel. And preaching always points back to this. It always takes the hearer back to this reality, whether converted or unconverted. It pulls them up and sets them before the cross and says, Behold, the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. Fifthly, a fifth aspect of preaching is that it covers the full counsel of God. It covers the full counsel of God. And I said this earlier, that if a man is giving himself to preach the word, to be theocentric, 
to deal with man, man's deadness to sin, his love for sin, and to proclaim the gospel of Christ, he also will cover the full counsel of God. True preaching does not skip over uncomfortable topics. True preaching does not say, well, the hearers are not ready. We must skip this for now. Because the scriptures do not do such a thing. Preaching does not say, I am sorry, but I must cover this issue. It unapologetically gives the truth of scripture to the hearer. That is not only biblical preaching, proper preaching, but honest preaching. See, if one admits the truth, that is a lie. If you admit that which you know to be true, that's a lie by your omission. For example, if you know that you owe someone a particular piece of information and you specifically hold that back, you've deceived, you've lied by your admission. And so it is with those who claim to preach, yet skip over topics that they themselves are not comfortable with. Or perhaps improperly interpret the text so as to turn the doctrine that the text clearly teaches into something else. That's a lie. They are liars. And they are to be greatly pitied. Greatly pitied indeed. A sixth aspect of preaching is that it is applicatory. It is obligatory. It is not up in the stratosphere and never comes down to earth. In fact, we could say it this way. Preaching brings the hearers up into the stratosphere where the truth of God reigns. It brings the hearer up to weighty and high and heavenly things and says, here is how this will work in your life. This is what this will look like. True preaching is applicatory. It calls the hearers, both unconverted and converted, to react. For example, if the sermon itself is on prayer, and it has been biblical, it will also call the converted ones in the pews to pray. And how to pray. Not just to pray, but how, when, where, why. And then it will call the unconverted to pray for salvation. Do you see that? True preaching is obligatory. In fact, if a man were to get up and preach a great sermon on great, weighty truth, but then totally overlook application on how, this, how the hearer can deal with it. How? What, what do I need to do? How do I react to this? I say that they have not done full justice to the text, to the counsel of God, or to the hearers. But it said they wasted precious time. For the hero walks away saying, well, that was a good sermon. The truth was conveyed. Christ was exalted. But I know not how I am to walk. I don't know what I am to do. Oh, well, it was a good sermon nonetheless. Oh, I pity such people. The Word of God changes lives. It, it is applicable. Truth in Scripture is applicable. And it needs to change our lives. And when the Word is preached, we must go from saying, God is, God is, God is. And God has done this. And man is like this to saying, you must do this. It goes from teaching on these great truths to saying, now, you, you listener, must react. And here's how you ought to. You see that? Look, we even see it in Jesus' own ministry. In Mark 1, verse 15. Listen to what Jesus says. The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. So what does he say? Two amazing truths. The time is fulfilled. I'm coming. The right time is here. The Son of God has appeared. The kingdom of God is at hand. And then what does he say? Repent and believe in the gospel. Notice he goes straight to application and says, here's what you need to do. Repent and believe the gospel. In the light of this truth, as I have set this reality before your eyes, don't just stand there. Repent and believe the gospel. That's true preaching. It sets the truth before the hearer and says, don't just stand there. React. A seventh aspect of biblical preaching, or proper preaching, is that it is powerful. 
It is powerful because it is biblical. It is theocentric. It deals with man's sin and his deadness in it. It proclaims the gospel of Christ. It covers the full counsel of God. It is obligatory. Therefore, it is powerful. It has power behind it. As I said, that Greek word, caruso, it, it carries with it the idea that it's not only you're just proclaiming something and telling someone some, about something, it's with weightiness and authority. We're heralds of the king. It changes lives. And that's what I want to consider. Fourthly, the effect of preaching. The fourth point, the effect of of preaching. Firstly, it accomplishes conversion. It accomplishes conversion. We see this in Acts chapter 2, which we've looked at before in the past. Peter preaches the gospel, makes Christ known to those thousands of people there in Jerusalem for Pentecost. And they said, what shall we do? He said, repent. 3,000 people were added to the church that day. What was that? Why did that happen? From where did that come? From God, yes. But what did He use? What means did God use? What tool? What instrument? Preaching. Preaching. How did Jesus amass such a following? Those followers, those disciples of Him. Preaching. Preaching. Paul, how did he start these churches in these various cities? Throughout the Roman Empire. Preaching. He did it through preaching. How did the early church grow and expand even under the intense persecution of Roman emperors? Preaching. Preaching. And how for the past around 2,000 years of church history has God's church grown to what it is today? Preaching. Preached word. It's conversions. How does the kingdom of God grow? Through conversions. People are added to the kingdom. They are taken out of the, the kingdom of darkness, brought into the kingdom of God's own Son, His beloved only begotten Son, and they are there in the kingdom. And that comes through hearing the word preached, hearing the gospel preached. It's powerful. It's powerful. Secondly, it procures sanctification. Sanctification for God's people. That is their encouragement in godliness. Their walk in purity. Brethren, I love to hear the word of God preached. In fact, each morning, uh, one of the activities I enjoy doing is running. I thoroughly enjoy running. It's invigorating. One of the things I love to do is some people love to listen to music as they run. But my favorite thing to listen to is preaching as I'm running. Oh, what a powerful exercise. The soul is encouraged the soul is disciplined and the body is being disciplined at the same time. It delights my heart to listen to preaching each morning from the great men of God. I'm sanctified by it. I'm convicted. I'm broken. I am taught how to be a better preacher myself by listening to the example of other men. Do you see that? Brethren, it's important that we listen. That we give ourselves to the listening of preaching. Especially as I myself as a preacher. <clears throat> Preachers ought to listen to preaching. A lot of it. Good preaching. So that they might be sanctified. Set apart. Be holy. Through preaching we are convicted of sin. We are encouraged to put to death the deeds of the flesh. We are encouraged to walk in holiness. We are exhorted to believe the gospel more and more. And to live in obedience to the full counsel of God as Christians. Thirdly, the effect that preaching has is to bring glory to God. It brings God glory. It exalts God. As I've said before already, it's God-centered, and because it preaches the gospel, which is about God, which is about the triune God, it exalts God and gives Him glory and praises Him. It brings glory to God. We see it at the end of Hebrews, where the author of Hebrews lifts up doxology to God at the end of that precious book, which I am under the persuasion that perhaps is a sermon. At the end of that, the preacher exalts God, lifts him up in holy adoration. Brethren, 
Preaching is powerful. And I want to share a brief story on the power of preaching. It's from a man's life. A man by the name of Charles Spurgeon. Who is one of the most famous preachers in all of church history. In fact, he is called the Prince of Preachers. He had a large congregation in London in the 1800s, around 6,000 people, largest Protestant church in the world during the time. And he knew every person by name in the church and personally interviewed each one of them for membership. But however, this man was not always converted. There was certainly a time in his life when he was unconverted. He was raised in a godly home. His father was a preacher and his father's father was a preacher. His parents pleaded with the Lord for his conversion. However, it did not come about until his teen years. And he struggled for years, convicted over his sin, broken, wanting to be saved. And on a cold January morning, he stumbled upon a primitive Methodist church where a meeting of about 15 people was taking place. And the pastor himself, the preacher, was prevented from coming that morning. No one was going to preach. One of the men in the congregation stood up and read out of Isaiah. Look to me and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And the man offered a few exhortations on that text. And then, moved by the Spirit of God, he pointed to Charles Spurgeon, the young teenage boy who had stumbled into the church and pointed to him and it told him in front of everyone in the middle of his sermon, look to him and be saved, all the ends of the earth. And Charles Spurgeon said, I looked and I was saved. And he went on, and at the age of 17, pastored a church for two years, and then moved at the age of 19 to London and began pastoring the Metropolitan Tabernacle. At that time, it was known as New Park, uh, New, Street, uh, New Park Street Chapel. He went on to write 150 books, preach many sermons, and to live his life to the glory of God. Preaching is powerful. And brethren, look at where that man's conversion took place. In a small little church. Fifteen people. That's a small group. And even the man who was preaching wasn't the pastor. Offered a few exhortations. But the word was preached. The word was preached. And therefore, Mr. Spurgeon was converted. Brought into the kingdom by God's grace. just here every week, but I would encourage you to throughout your week listen to preaching, good preaching, biblical preaching, theocentric preaching that deals with the full counsel of God and calls you to act. Also, I encourage you not only to give yourself to listening to preaching, but to meditate upon what you have heard. It is very fitting for those of you who are married to, after leaving church, discuss the sermon. To discuss what was spoken. To discuss the truth of the scriptures that were brought forth. You will find that your souls are encouraged. And through that discuss, discussion, you meditate upon what was preached. Also, thirdly, I encourage you, brethren, to pray. Before and after you listen to God's word preached. Not just before and not just after, but before and after. For your own soul. For the preacher himself. For me as I preach. And then for your own selves. And then preach after, or pray after the preaching. That God's blessing would now be upon his word as it has gone forth. Fourthly, my exhortation is for you to obey. When you hear the word preached and you hear the preacher giving exhortation and application, it is your duty and it is now on your hands, on your shoulders to obey. 
and you would do so. You would do well to do so. Also, for those of you who perhaps claim to have known Christ or do know Christ, yet are hypocrites, you perhaps sit under the preaching of the word week by week, and yet you still do not believe. You do not care for holiness, and the power that God manifested in raising His own Son from the dead is not at work in your life. It's not at work in you to conform you to Christ's image, and you see that, you know that. I will say in the words of my Lord, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. That is my exhortation to you is to repent and to believe the gospel. To flee sin. To flee your rebellion. And to flee to Christ. And perhaps for many years of your life, you listen to preaching, but you did not really care for it. It was not a delight to your heart. Oh, come unto Christ, that you might delight in preaching. It's a joy for the child of God. They prefer it over any of the entertainments that this world has to offer. And lastly, if you've never even heard the word preached, and this is your first time, and you've heard of Christ, you've heard of the gospel of Christ brought forth, and you have yet to believe, the call is the same for you as well. Repent and believe in the gospel. Obey God rather than men. Do not care what your family or friends will think. Do not care what this world thinks. Give care to what God has to say and what God thinks of you. Do not be a man pleaser. But seek to glorify God in your life. So we have seen here in Mark chapter 1 verses 36 through 39 and also in other passages. The importance of preaching. That one, it was Jesus' ministry focus. Two, we've seen the need of preaching. The need for preaching. Thirdly, we've seen the act of preaching. What it is in its essence. And fourthly, we have considered the effect of preaching. What does it bring about? What does it procure? It is a means God has chosen to further His kingdom. This God who is holy and pure, righteous in all His ways, who will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, who is abounding in grace and loving kindness, who gave His law but we broke it, who said you shall not lie or steal. We have done those things and many other things against Him and thereby are condemned to hell without hope, the place of torment for the ungodly. But as we saw this morning in Sunday school, God chose a people to Himself, a remnant whom He would save. And so when the right time came, Jesus came and fulfilled the law. As He said there in Mark 1.15, He fulfilled. The time is fulfilled. He's come to fulfill. The kingdom of God is at hand. Christ fulfilled the law for His people and died upon the cross, bearing their sins on His own self and the wrath of God against them and satisfied and was raised. The Father manifested great power in raising His Son up from the dead. And all who repent and believe on Christ are saved. They cannot cause it to happen in themselves. They are gifts from God, but they are forgiven of sin if they repent and believe. And they are wrapped in the righteousness of Jesus Christ. By grace. Their lives are changed. New hearts, new desires. They no longer love the sin that they once loved. They hate it. And they now love the God they once hated. It's all by grace. Ultimately, that God might receive the glory. That's the purpose of preaching. That's the purpose of salvation. That's the purpose of all things. So may the Father, Son, and Spirit be brought all glory in all things forever. Let's close in prayer.
Father, I do pray that as the word has gone forth, you would bless it. And you would be glorified in us. Oh God, may your word have effect. May your word have effect. For Jesus' sake and for Jesus'